Now, I want to start with an exercise as we come to our sermon today. Our text will be primarily Genesis chapter 28. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and feel free to open to Genesis chapter 28. Matter of fact, while, uh, while you're turning there as well, I'm going to go ahead and get mine open to 28. Um, I put my marker there because we're not going to use it just yet. Genesis chapter 28, though, I want us to play a quick game. So your life. I want you to um, picture your life for a moment exactly as it is. So you are the person that you are. Has anyone seen the movie like The Born Identity? Who's seen The Born The Born movies? Okay, I got a couple of you. I'm trying to think of another one. Okay, let's think of another movie that's kind of that. Uh, well, here, here's here's the scenario. You committed something, some crime and you've got to go undercover, okay? So it's your life, but you've got to go into hiding. So I'm going to start off by asking, what crime did you commit? Oh, too cute. Robbery. What'd you rob? You robbed your folks? Oh, that's low. That's low. You could at least rob like a bank or something. By, by the way, anyone, this is all hypothetical. What would you, what crime would you commit? Well, that's first degree. If you're on the first degree side, premeditated murder. Okay, so we got a murderer, we got a robber, and we got someone who's just too cute. What other, what other crimes would you commit? I don't see any, no other crimes? We're, we're, we're going for it. Go big. Robin. Oh, Italian job. What's that? Oh, wow. We went there. Okay, we're going to be an explosives expert now. Okay. So we've got this idea. We're now, we're robbing Fort Knox over here. We're blowing up places. We're murdering people and we're robbing people. Okay. Now, what happens once you do the crime? Provided that you're able to actually like, you know, like you're actually able to get out of the bank or you're able to, you know, you're walking on like, what do you do next? Run and hide. Who said hide? I heard run from right here. Hide. Okay, so what do you do after you've run and hid? Like, okay, so think about hiding. Have you ever tried to hide from the federal government? Anyone here a professional hider from the federal government? Okay, so I want you to think, how do you hide? Oh. <laughs> I don't think you'd raise your hand. How many of you, oh, I don't have my phone with me. How many, who said off-grid? Ashley, that's right. How many of you would have to give up your cell phone? I mean, if, you're, if you just committed a massive crime, you can't have anything that's going to be traceable. Okay, so now you've gotten rid of your cell phone. What next have you gotten rid of? Credit cards. Oh, how come? Man, every movie, that's what they do. They're always waiting for a credit card to swipe or a phone to turn on. So they, you know, they swiped the card. So what else you got rid of? So you got rid of your cell phone, you got rid of your credit card. What else you get rid of? Your car. Your car. How come? Oh, man, they know what vehicle you're in. Miss Betty, you got one of those fancy cars with blue, uh, with, do you have OnStar in your car? No? Who's got OnStar in their car? You got OnStar? They know where you're at, don't they? Boy, you got to get rid of that car. Kitty, what were you going to say? <laughs> okay, I, I guess you got to get rid of the body too. You, you don't want any evidence. So at this point, though, they know you're on the run. So you got rid of your phone, you got rid of your car, we've getting rid of credit cards. So, how, I mean, how do you do this at this point? Because you can't go anywhere because there's cameras everywhere. You, you got to change your identity, color your hair. Color your hair. Maybe you even shave it all off. Who knows? So you're now running. You're living life on the run. What happens your first night of life on the run? <laughs> if you didn't hear, I'd get caught. <laughs> Not much sleep. Oh, 
Do you ever think about the night you commit your first major crime? Which I hope none of you ever commit a first major crime, by the way. But the night you commit your first major crime, how much sleep are you going to get? Some of y'all are like, oh, I won't have any problem sleeping. No, that's a lie. You will. If you've got all this gold from Fort Knox, you ain't going to know what to do with it. You're going to be sitting there paranoid. So we come to this life on the run, and we realize that, man, I've given up all of the things that I hold dear. I mean, you, you have, the only money you've got is money that you may have in your pocket. You don't have a phone. You can't call your family. Or you can't call anybody because the moment you do, what's going to happen? Oh, they're going to trace you. They're going to know. You, you can't be in the vehicles that you have, so you're trying to rent a car. Renting a car with cash isn't possible because, oh, by the way, you don't have cash. You're utterly alone. You could go to some church somewhere, but they've already posted up your picture on everywhere possible, so everyone around already knows you, and they're going to say, oh, no, this guy did this or this gal did this, and all of a sudden, you are utterly alone, and nighttime comes... And you have to live with yourself. I want you to imagine those feelings for a moment. Now, granted, we've been playing a fun game. It's all hypothetical at this point. But I want you to think real hard about what that first night's like. When you're laying in your bed. If Well, actually, it's not even your bed. Because you don't have a bed. You can't go home. You're sleeping out under the stars somewhere. Maybe under a bush, under a tree somewhere. Maybe you found a nice tree to kind of sit underneath and make a little bed out of and you're laying there and there's nothing for you to talk to that's kind of our story today from genesis chapter 27 and 28 this is the account of jacob and jacob if you know jacob does jacob have a brother who's jacob's brother let me ask that esau Jacob has a brother, Esau. Which one was born first? Esau. And then Jacob was born second. So Esau's the oldest. And Jacob has this name. That what, what does his name mean? For those of you who are aware of it. Heel grabber. He's known as a heel grabber from the get-go. Because as he comes out of the womb, he's even grabbing the heel. And mind you, in the Jacob and Esau story... We move a little bit further forward, and Esau's been out hunting all day. He's real hot. He's sweaty. He's tired. He sits down, and Jacob has a pot of forage. I'm calling it forage because that's the three little bears. But he's got a pot of soup. And he says, hey, I'll give you a pot of soup if you give me your birthright, your inheritance. And what does Esau do? Okay, you can have it. Give me some soup. And so he does. Now, I don't know how, I mean, ja Jacob, I don't think Jacob of, that, of being that much of a con artist in that situation, but apparently he was. We move forward, though, to chapter 27 of Genesis. And as we've started in chapter 27 of Genesis, Jacob and Esau, they're still there. Their father Isaac is, it says that, that Isaac is getting old. He's mostly blind. He really can't see. And he knows he's about to die, so he says, Esau, go hunt an animal for me. Bring it back. Um, fix me a meal, and I'm going to give you a blessing. So Esau runs off. Well, Mama hears this and says, Hey, Jacob, let's go make your dad's favorite dish real quick, and we're going to get you that blessing. So she does. Jacob goes in. By the way, he puts on Esau's clothes. It says that he put, like, goat hair on the back of his hand, which I'm imagining, you know, I feel the back of my hand. I do not feel like a goat. So that must tell me something about Esau, if Esau's skin was like that of a goat. But he goes in, he gives Isaac the food, and Isaac says, this doesn't sound like my son Esau, but I'm going to trust that it is. So he gives Jacob the blessing. And later on, we're told in Genesis 27, when Esau comes back and Esau is furious, he says, Daddy, I mean, basically, you can imagine he's on his knees, he's saying, Dad, give me some sort of a blessing. And, Esau, and Isaac says, there's nothing I can give you, Esau. I gave everything to your brother. And at the end of 27, uh, Esau is furious. Oh, his comment is, he says, just wait till my dad dies. I'm going to kill my brother. So there's, for those of you who are thinking premeditated murder, first degree, thank you, there's Esau. Isaac is afraid. 
He is alone. And all of a sudden, he's got someone hunting his life. And he's on the run now. Isaac, or, uh, yeah, Isaac sends him on his way. He says, you need to go find a wife. Go back to your mom's family because they're not going to hunt you down. But go to your mom's side of the family and find a wife. So he does. And as he's journeying, which by the way, the journey that he's on is like 500 miles. It's several months of travel time. And as he's on this journey, he has no credit card. He has no cell phone. He is completely alone. It's not like he even has servants that are traveling with him. Because he left in such a haste because he was worried he was going to die. And as he begins this travel, he gets just a couple of days in. And he makes it to this region, kind of this region around Luz, if I'm pronouncing that properly. He gets to this area, and that's where chapter 28 really kicks in. We're told that in verse 11 of the text, if you have your Bibles, you can look there. But in verse 11, we're told that Jacob is traveling along and that nighttime comes, which, by the way, God seems to work some amazing things at nighttime. And we're told that as nighttime comes, he reaches this spot and he's outside of town because he's really afraid. He's alone. He doesn't have anything to his name. He just knows where he's trying to get to. And as he's outside of town, I think verse 11 says he takes a stone for a pillow. Is that correct? You ever laid down with a stone as your pillow? I haven't either. I used a tree one time, but it wasn't, it wasn't like I was needing a pillow. It's like I needed something to lean against. He takes a stone for a pillow. He falls asleep. That's where verse 12 kicks in. Verse 12, he says, For I had a dream in which I saw a stairway. Some of your translations may say ladders, but it doesn't matter. Stairway or a ladder. Resting on the earth with its top reaching the heavens. And what was going up and down on the ladder, or on the stairway? Angels. So can you picture this for a moment? I want you, if you want a ladder, put a ladder in, or if you want stairs, put stairs in. I almost brought one of those little A-frame ladders in here, and I was going to get someone to go up and down it. But I thought, well, by the time they went up and down, they'd probably fall, and that would be bad. Verse 13, though. There above it stood the Lord. So God is standing at the top. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land of which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. And you will spread out to the, to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through your offspring. If you highlight in your Bible, I want you to highlight that last part of verse 14. Okay? If you don't highlight, that's okay. Just remember that. All peoples of earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you. I will watch over you. Wherever you go, I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. I want you to think about that dream for a moment. Have you all seen a picture of this? The ladder or the stairway to heaven? Can you see it in your head? Jacob is laying in the most desolate of places that he knows right now. And when I say desolate, I mean he is staying in a very desolate place because who does he have around him? Nobody. How much money does he have in his bank account? None. What in his life right now is providing any sense of comfort? A rock. So, if that is the greatest comfort in his life, then we know exactly how comfortable his life is right now. But I want you to look at Jacob's life story for a moment and realize that at this point in Jacob's narrative, God has not spoken to Jacob. This is the first time that God speaks to Jacob. 
How often did God speak to Abraham? A lot. lot. That's the correct answer. If you want to go through and count them, feel free to. But the correct answer is God spoke to Abraham a lot. How often did God speak to Isaac? A lot is another correct answer. How often has he spoke to Jacob at this point? Zilch. None. This is the first. So out of his entire life, the first thing I notice is that out of his life, his faith is totally dependent upon what his grandfather and what his father have taught him. His faith is not his own because he has yet to hear the voice of God. At this point, his faith is only what grandpa said, what daddy said, and this is where I'm at. And by the way, is his life exactly the stellar life example? No. He's a heel grabber. He's a thief, a con artist. That's what he is. I start with Jacob, and I realize that sometimes in life, the positions that we're in are the same position he's in. Have you heard the voice of God recently? Is your faith your faith? Have you heard God speak in such a way that said, this is what I know I need to do? And so when I look at Jacob's account here, I realize that the first thing is that regardless of if you have heard the voice of God, where was God at? Regardless of when Jacob heard the voice of God, where was God? He was in heaven. But what does the stairway represent? It represents his presence. God, at this point, Jacob could very easily say that God is a God that lives up in heaven and that has nothing to do with earth. Have you ever felt that way before? You ever felt that God does, is not concerned about what's going on in your life? Have you ever felt that God has abandoned you? That I can live my life, I can do what I want to do, but it does not matter because God's up there and I'm down here. Has anyone else but me ever struggled with that? And, you, and, and that becomes so easy for us Because how often do we see God work in amazing, magnificent ways? How often do we see Him part the Red Sea? How often do we see Him do the things like stop the sun in the sky? It becomes very easy for us to put God up there and us down here and to not see the connection between the two. But even when God has not spoken to you, where was He at in Jacob's life? He was right there. In the most desolate of places where the only comfort is a rock, God was still right there. I want you to say that with me. God was still right there. God was still right there. It doesn't matter what's going on in Jacob's life. If every comfort has been robbed away from him, has been stolen away, has been probably conned away from him, let's say, God was still right there. And as we're looking a little bit more at Jacob's life here, I want you to think about the desolation that he's in. If the most comfortable thing you can find is a rock, there's nothing there. That means there's not even a tree around. If I were out in the wilderness and I was looking for something comfortable, I would not look for a rock. I would find a tree. And I would say, huh, well, if there's one tree, you know, I could probably make like a little bed of something. I can at least make some leaves and find some way to make a pallet out of it. I'm not a rocket scientist, but I figure I could do that. I mean, could you do that? Glenda, if you're out in the middle of the woods and and you needed to find something comfortable, could you make a pallet out of some grass? There we go. Any one of us could make a pallet out of some grass or whatever. But to tell us how desolate it is, the best thing he could find is a rock. And in the place which, at the ending of that, verses 16 and 17, I find they're even more comical. Because his idea of God is that this place is so horrible, so desolate, that not even God is here. You know how I know that? What's he say in verse 16 and 17? What's Jacob's comment in 16 and 17? I didn't know it. But surely God is here. Man, this is the gateway to heaven. He starts realizing that where he's at in the most desolate of places of life is exactly the place that God was. He was never left alone. It wasn't like he was by himself. Oh, man. Have you felt alone recently? 
has life made you feel like you are in a place with no comfort and where a rock may be your best friend? I don't know, with, with you, this past year, all the stuff that's gone on in our world, man, it's easy to look around and say, there's no hope. Where's God at? Maybe he's just letting our world fall apart. Maybe he's just letting our country fall apart. Maybe he's just letting our, our city of Louisville and the surrounding area fall apart. It's really easy to look and to say, where's God at in all of the destruction? That's kind of what Jacob was doing. In a place where only a rock finds the comfort for you. But the point of the latter is that even in the middle of the desolate places... God is still there. Say that with me. God is still there. Say that one more time. God is still there. Even when it is desolate and there is nothing left, God is still there. And so as I look at Jacob just a little bit further, I realize why is Jacob in the desolate place of Luz? Why is he there? Because of his poor choice. You ever think, if Jacob hadn't have been a hill grabber, what would have happened to him? He'd still been at home in bed. Mama still would have been there cooking, as well as whatever servants the family had. They'd all been taking care of everything. And oh, by the way, when Daddy died, guess what happened? He'd have gotten an allowance. Esau would have gotten the birthright, but Esau's responsibility would have been to take care of the family. He would have gotten an allowance out of this. He would have been somewhat taken care of. So he could have lived a modest, comfortable life for as long as he lived, if only he wouldn't have been a hill grabber. He's in this situation because of his actions. Because of his, we're going to call it corruptness. Oh, man. You ever look at your life and say, I'm in a pickle, and it ain't nobody's fault but me. You ever look at your life and say, man, I am in a pickle, and it's nobody's fault but me. Everything in my life is pretty bad right now, and it's nobody's fault but mine. And I can look back at whether I say it's my, my physical life is in a pickle, or I can look and say my spiritual life is in a pickle. I can look at both of those things and say, if they're in a pickle, it's because of me. And this is the account where God steps into Jacob's life and says, Jacob, your life may feel like you're in a pickle, but guess what? I'm still there. Say, I'm still there. God is speaking to Jacob, and he's saying, I am still there. You want a ladder that's going up and down from heaven? And by the way, when they were looking at this, I want you to kind of, in your head, Picture back to the Tower of Babel for a moment. What was the Tower of Babel's intent by its creators? They wanted to reach God. And so in this entire time period of early Genesis, the idea of God communicating with earth, with God's connection to earth, consisted of some form of a tower, some form of a staircase. And, and the idea that comes across in, in, old, in other religions besides just the Judaic background here is this idea of angels going up and down. And the implication is that as these angels are traveling up and down the ladder, they are taking concerns to God and bringing God's answers back. They are taking the responses and the prayers and the needs of God's people to God, and they're bringing them back. And this ladder just happens to be right beside Jacob. The angels that are assigned to work Jacob's life are the very angels that are taking the requests up to God and God is answering them and bringing the requests back. And so as Jacob is in this desolate place, abandoned by his family, abandoned by life, and yet in this moment, he's abandoned by his own actions, the wrongs that he committed, God steps in and says, I don't care what you've done. I don't care where your wrongs have been. I'm still right here. Say, I'm still, right here. I'm still right here. The entire time that Jacob is in this running situation where he has no hope, no, there, there's no comfort, 
God was still right there. And I don't know where you're at in life. I don't know where you are at. Some of you may say that I've already passed this experience in life. I've already found my way. You know, the future story of Jacob as he goes on, he finds his wife. Everything ends up happy. He comes back, he's restored to his brother. Man, it's a great story. It takes a while for us to get there. But it's a great ending. So I don't know where your life is at. Maybe your life is already past this difficult time. Maybe you're already past the struggles. And maybe you're the type of person who has already said, Josh, I've already experienced a moment of aloneness, of isolation, and of fear. I've already done some of my stupid stuff. And matter of fact, I've gotten to this point in life, and God has still saved me through it. Praise God for that. Can we get an amen? amen. Now, some of you, though, may not be there. Some of you may be in a place where you do feel alone, where you feel as if God is somewhat separated, as if he is up there and he's not here. And maybe for some of you, you say, where is God in all of my struggles? Maybe, maybe even you're looking at your life and you're saying, I really haven't done anything foolish. I live a modestly moral life. I, I do the best that I can. And maybe some of you are saying, I just don't understand. Jacob came out of his mama this way. I wonder if he ever questioned, why am I a heel grabber? I don't know. But I know he's looking at his life. And in the moment that he felt most alone is the moment that God was right there that God was saying to him, I'm still right here. Matter of fact, where do you think, is, do you think it's possible that that ladder went down to his heart in some way? Do you think that that staircase that those angels were going up and down on, maybe that staircase was in his heart? Greg's over there shaking no. Greg, you got to follow me to where I'm about to go, though. I, know, I, know, I think I know where you're leading, where you're afraid that I'm going because I go forward to John chapter 1 and verse 50 John chapter 1 verse 50 this is Jesus speaking by the way <clears throat> because I said to you I saw you under the fig tree do you believe well, you, you will see greater things than these. And he said, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened. What did Jacob call this space? The gateway to heaven. You will see heaven opened and the angels of God are doing what? Ascending and descending on the Son of Man. I didn't put the verse up there. I should have. Jesus in the early part of the Gospel of John says you are going to see angels going up and down from heaven and they're going to be traveling on whom? It ain't going to be a stairway, it ain't going to be a ladder. They're going to be traveling on the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. So in the middle of Jacob's despair, he saw a ladder that angels were going up and down to that were taking and receiving requests from God. And when we come to Jesus, the man whom our faith is in, he says, there's a ladder that still goes to heaven. There's a ladder that still reaches me. That is a ladder that I have placed into every one of my people that connects me to them. It is a ladder that still has angels traveling up and down on it. It is a ladder that God has given to us so that in the most isolated moments of love life, in the times when we question where is God and where, where is he at in my pain or in my difficulty, God says, I'm still right there. I am still right there. Regardless of where you've been, what you've done, regardless of all the world's circumstances, regardless of the discomfort that's in your life, I am still there. The passage that we're talking about in Genesis 28 is a passage that tells us of how close our God is in each one of our lives. So as I said earlier, I don't know where you're at. I don't know what comfort you can find in this passage. 
I do hope this, that you can find a confidence to know that God is near and that in every part of your life, I am still there. Say that with me. I am still there. We're going to have an application prayer here in just a moment. While Lyle leads us in that application prayer, oh, he's jumped up. It's okay. While, while Lyle leads us in that application prayer, I want you to think for yourself, where am I at in my journey with God? Like I said, Jacob's future story works out pretty good. The story leading up to this part wasn't the greatest. Maybe your life is exactly where Jacob's at. Maybe your life is in the middle of a desolate, isolated moment. And if it is, I want to be a source of confidence in your life. Not me, personally. God. And I want us as a church to be a place where you can feel connected to a God who loves you even more. Now let's let Lyle lead us in our application prayer. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has created in advance for us to do. Almost got that right. I am actually filming this today in North Carolina, and by Sunday, I'll have returned home to Louisville and be in Texas visiting my mother and then also going on a work trip. So, hence the background. It's a little bit out of this world for me these days. I'm sure Josh delivered a fantastic message today, talking about dreams and all sorts of things, but mostly that God loves us. He truly does have things that he wants us to do. We just have to willingly submit. Will you bow with me? Thanks for your time today in worship. Lord, we thank you so much for your presence. Just like Jesus called Nathaniel, let us hear your call and be willing servants. Let us go out and share the good news. The good news that we are saved through you. The good news of our church, Oklahoma, help us to be ever loving servants of you, Lord. Looking out for one another, looking out for others, expressing our love through our acts, our acts of love to you and service to others. In your son's name we pray, amen. Thanks everybody.